If your brother was killed and you chose a path of bloody revenge that sent you into Heisenberg's twisted maze of booby traps, what would you do? I'm an equal opportunity survivalist. Smart, dumb, or insidiously stupid. Everyone deserves to hear how their idiotic choices and harebrained schemes are gonna get them killed. This group of thieves have a smattering of competency between them, but most are merely fodder for the slaughter funnel that they're walking into. No strategy, no planning, and terrible timing won't stop them from trying to rob the most brutal gang in the city. Their only hope is the Nat 20 plot armor they walked in wearing. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death traps in Trap House. In a den of blue sky users, a teenager named Ryan partakes and becomes paranoid. He tries to warn his fellow users that they need to leave, that something is coming, but they're too zonked to listen. SWAT bashes the door in, and Ryan bolts deeper into the den. One officer gives chase, cornering him right before he opens a door and takes a nasty surprise to the face. <laughs> The officer screams into his radio for backup, but a signal jammer mutes his cries for help. He plunges deeper into the facility, sees the cook, and fires wildly. Then he hears it. He's pressed a trap button with his foot without realizing it. A clear gas begins to pump into the room. We'll learn in a bit that this is sarin nerve gas, which attacks the entire body. It can blind you, cause seizures, and something called floppy paralysis, and drown you in your own fluids. A loss? It doesn't occur to him to pull out the gas mask SWAT members carry with them, but it wouldn't have mattered. One to 10 milliliters of sarin on the skin can be fatal in minutes. And because aerosol sarin is denser than air, it can pool along the floor. So when you fall, it'll be there to finish the job. The most immediate thing he can do is run out of the room and hopefully back toward the rest of his unit. But even if he makes it, he risks contact poisoning his men if he stops breathing and they try to give him mouth to mouth. The next day, Detective Grant Pierce arrives at the crime scene. We get our first glimpse of total incompetency when the chief tells him that SWAT didn't call this crime in. Neighbors saw the cook leaving with a woman after shots were fired. The chief isn't too choked up about the loss of life. He tells Grant to get a load of what happened to one of the victims, like it's the funniest thing he's seen. Grant goes cold as he notices the tattoo on the body's arm. <laughs> It's his brother, Ryan. In the aftermath, the chief debriefs homicide. They know the trap houses are operated by a gang led by the cook and an unknown business partner who rules their herd of dealers with an iron fist. Even though they change locations every few days to evade the DEA, they go overboard with booby traps to punish anyone who might come knocking. Grant tells the chief he has a theory on the cook. He must be a military vet, given the sarin gas. He even suggests he may have served in the Gulf War, as sarin gas was the cause of the Gulf War illness. The chief says he'll pass the info along, telling Grant he can't be part of the investigation. Grant's furious, but the chief won't budge. Neither will Grant. He tracks down a teenage dealer named Fibs and interrogates him at knife point for information about who sold to Ryan. Fibs says he doesn't know, and his high panicked voice alerts two nearby enforcers. Fibs runs, and Grant beats the shit out of them. Excuse me? Did someone use a neck snapping sound effect? Okay, Rambo. Grant corners Fibs again, flashing his badge this time, and forcing the kid to give up the trap house location. Fibs takes him to a giant industrial slaughterhouse run by back alley entrepreneur Lexi and the cook who's named Lithon. Side note, what the f is up with giving everyone weird names? Grant wants to go inside, but Fibs reminds him the gang will rip their d off if he approaches the building with someone they don't know. Fibs tells him to call in backup, but Grant won't do that. Fibs realizes he's gone rogue. Great, leave right now. Open the door and run. Will the cop come back? Maybe, but it's not like he can offer you immunity. He'd have to sign it off with his department, which doesn't even know he's here. So there's no benefit to staying unless there's child locks on the door. Even then, wait until you're out of the car and bolt. And Grant, you weren't suggesting you are going to walk into an illicit candy factory run by brutal go-go gadget psychopaths with nothing but a sweater and a handgun, are you? You saw your brother's liquefied head. If, if you go into that building, it's wearing the f 
mech suit from Edge of Tomorrow. You better gear up in full PPE for sarin traps and be blinged out in smoke grenades too. And frankly, this whole I can't tell my boss I was snooping shit is ridiculous. You can't tell him you accosted a teenager at knife point and beat up two randos for information. But you can say that one of your informants heard about your brother's death and wants to give up the location of the next trap house in exchange for immunity. Fibs takes pity on Grant and agrees to get him into the building in a couple days. The next day, the chief calls Grant into his office. He shows him video surveillance from his alley fight and suspends him. Maybe this is a great time to tell him about the trap house, then? Say you were contacting an informant who had info on the location when two guys jumped you. Across town, Fibs goes to sell goodies to a clown named Roscoe when he's ambushed by one of the gang's higher-ups, Cormac. Cormac warns that Fibs is behind on the payments and arms length away from getting the soul beaten out of his body. Cormac offers to forgive his debt if Fibs robs Lathon for him. Shaking in his Nikes, Fibs is forced to agree with one condition. He loops Grant into the deal. Cormac meets with Grant, suspicious that he's the man on the alley brawl video making the rounds everywhere. Grant claims that he's willing to rob a notorious gang leader for no reward because he owes his buddy Fibs a favor. Right. Fibs gets sent into the factory to pick up more product and study the layout. The whole place has a real 90s college party vibe to it. He sneaks out to explore, spots the money, and watches Lexi step over a tripwire at ankle level. Back at Roscoe's Clown Emporium, he lays out the super complicated building specs of a single section of this massive complex. Cormac and Grant decide tonight is the night they attack because neither has ever seen literally any action movie before. Earlier, Grant told Fibs that this slaughterhouse building was historical, which means it might be possible to find old maps or blueprints online. At the very least, they should survey the perimeter, count guards, and locate secondary exits. Curiously, Fibs doesn't tell them about the tripwire, sly dog, but neither does Grant, so everyone's expendable in the pursuit of personal vengeance. Vengeance, I guess. With barely more than a couple handguns, the dollar store lineup for the Suicide Squad approaches the building. In slow motion, it's completely undisguised. Suddenly, Roscoe notices a tail. They turn to find a kid from Fibs' school. Mo has followed them. Fibs tries to scare him off, but Cormac only has one dimension. So he cuts eye holes in the kid's beanie and welcomes him to the gang, saying he can't rat him out if he's an accomplice, which isn't how anything works. So what he's really saying is that he can't be a rat if he's dead. This kid is definitely dying three steps into this place. Fibs approaches the door and lures the guard out before Cormac pops a hole in his neck like a Capri Sun. Not gonna lie, my scorn levels were rising with literally every step these people took to this point. But then we get this little scene. And I realized this is actually a comedy. 10 seconds later, the group wanders into the unguarded main office to find the money is missing or has already been stashed in the safe. Irritated, Cormac makes as much noise as he can, short of screaming, and to no joke, takes off his hood. They run back to the door they entered through to find it locked. So, of course, they have to double back looking for a second exit. Real shame you didn't do literally any prep for this mission. Mo notices a drop down attic door overhead and... <laughs> I shouldn't find this funny, but look, he died three steps into this place. Just like I said, Cormac drags Fibs away. Grant seizes his opportunity and sneaks off on his own. But just around the corner, he encounters Kevin McAllister's next trap. He walks into a pool of glue, which costs him his shoes. He steps out and repurposes his balaclava so he can monkey bar his way across via a steaming hot pipe overhead, which no, he doesn't. Cheap Balaclavas, like the ones they're using, are probably made out of spandex or some other very meltable material. So all he's doing is giving his hands a painful forever glove. If it's wool, it's heat resistant, but only barely at these thicknesses. He reaches another room littered with crushed glass. He stepped right onto it with his unprotected feet to grab a broom left within reach, triggering another trap. 
This was absolutely grabbable from the hall, so this is a bad trap. But also, in a pinch, take off your weird hoodie vest and sweep with that, and sweep faster. Cormac notices Grant is gone, and sends Roscoe and his girl Sandy off to kill him. Back in the glass room, Grant has barely swept two feet into the room when a guard announces his presence, giving Grant the chance to hide in a very checkable corner. Yo, goon, turn your head. God. After he's gone, Grant continues his half-assed sweep, leaving bloody footprints behind. You know, I bet if you laid the broom down the long way like a balance beam and just tore your hoodie down the seam and laid it out, you could probably balance, walk, and jump to the other side without any issue at all. Cormac and Fibs find their own trap. Clever. Hilarious that this gang supposedly changes headquarters every week and still has time to lay out elaborate jigsaw traps. Maybe the illicit candy they're selling is really just a side hustle to pay for their escape room hobby. Grant comes to a dead end with a human-sized ventilation shaft leading who knows where. So naturally, that must be the way to go. Go where? Jigsaw's laboratory? The tunnel of ninja stars? Fibs and Cormac find a hatch marked by the gang's symbol that leads to a baby nursery straight out of Barbarian. Fibs refuses to leave it behind, while Cormac warns the baby's basically a screaming tracker and someone's gonna want it back. Out in the hall, Roscoe saves Sandy from a swinging samurai sword before they hear something moving in the ducks overhead. It's Grant, trapped at the start of a tunnel full of mouse traps. Roscoe slices through the duct like it's made out of paper. Grant hits a trap and Roscoe slices again. Stop moving forward. You're not in that big a hurry, and the stuff these guys smoke has ground their attention span down to nothing. Wait for them to move on, then take the mousetrap you've already tripped and use it to trip the others. Instead, he continues crawling. They stab Grant through the thigh, loudly taunting until Sandy notices a guard watching. Roscoe takes one to the back as they retreat, and the guard triggers another trap. <laughs> Lexi finds the guard's body and puts the rest on high alert, but she doesn't bother to walk the extra 10 feet in the direction of the gunshots he was firing. It's not like anyone could be hiding literally around the corner. Now bleeding, Grant drags himself down the shaft to the cook's room. Lathan's jacked up on nose candy and fumes. Grant waits for him to leave and lowers himself down silently. Where was that stealth a few minutes ago, copper? Casually, he loosens the faucet on a flammable gas canister, and we've officially added Hitchcock's ticking bomb to the mix. In a building full of electrical wires, metal scrapping metal, and oh yeah, meth smokers. It's only a matter of time before a spark blows her sky high. Cormac, Fibs, and Chekhov's baby make it to another nondescript corridor before the baby attracts another guard. As Cormac lunges in to kill him, Fibs sneaks away, rolling a nat 20 for unbelievable luck, encountering zero booby traps as he navigates hallways full of locked rooms and finds a storage room to hide. And I finally understand how this gang is able to set this all up anew every week by half at everything. Where's the Saren, guys? Why did you only set up one? One shooting pipe. Sandy half carries Roscoe until the wound inflames, and he can't go on without a little no sugar inspiration. He spots a packet on the floor, and his senses betray him. <laughs> Anyone who's been with me for a while should know how to disarm a bear trap by now. Put pressure on the springs to either side of his foot so he can remove pressure from the pan and lift when the springs come apart. But you should also know that he just alerted half the building to their location. They have two guns and a samurai sword. Time for Sandy to ride or die by carefully stepping out of sight and ambushing anyone who investigates Roscoe screaming with a shot to the head. Unfortunately, Sandy doesn't know how to do any of that. And of course, she's not really really ride or die. When she realizes she can't get the trap open with her hands, she bounces, saying she's going to get help. Sure you are. Cormac uses movie magic to track Fibs' location, snatches the kid right out of his arms, but almost immediately, Lexi appears. Cormac knows it's her kid and taunts her that she won't shoot. He gets her to drop her gun and kick it over to him. But 
like, now she's seen your faces and you've endangered her kid. I know it's harsh, but Bang Bang solves these problems pretty easily. You don't even have to kill the kid. Or if you're too squeamish, grab the gun, put the kid at the far back of the room, have her get down on her stomach and leave, locking them in behind you. I mean, she will eat your heart out later if she lives. So, yeah. Cormac tells her he'll give her the baby back if she opens the safe for him, and she agrees very quickly, but not because it's an easy decision. She knows where all the traps are. Lexi puts on a quick waterworks show to compel Cormac to give her the kid, because then she can lead him into a trap without a second thought. Terrible exchange made. He tells her to lead. Nearby, Sandy stumbles into the hallway lined with live electrical wires leading to a very large exit sign that is obviously not an exit. She needs to look for an electrical insulator, like plastic or rubber. She's wearing sneakers, which should have rubber soles. Take them off, wear them on your hands, and see if you can pull the bases connected to the wires out of the walls. Probably not, and like I said, that is probably a fake exit, but it make your gallows walk a little less painful. Instead, she panics and gets tangled. <laughs> Back in the lab, Grant limps after the tweaked out cook. Lithon is oblivious to the man with the gun to his head, but Grant's out for revenge, which means just ending him isn't enough. He calls out to Lithon, who dodges as Grant fires. Roided out on nose candy, Lithon attacks like a juggernaut, disarming and overpowering Grant in seconds. Grant manages to knock him back and shoot him twice before a random distraction from Lexi allows Lithon to stab him in the leg. Bro, triple tap to the brain and you're done. Get out of here. And the hall, exactly what we all knew would happen, happens. Lexi leads Cormac into a trap and triggers steam to burn his face, allowing her to escape. Raid redemption style Lexi sicks her clan of dope fiends on them, promising free products in exchange for their heads. And guys, this is comedy gold. Every shot of them wandering the halls on the hunt comes complete with zombie noises. <laughs> for some reason. Don't worry, this is the tesseract of buildings, expanding and contracting depending on how big the movie needs it to be at any given moment, so there'll be a while. In the hallway, our three remaining dudes face off as Cormac tries to kill Fibs, then convinces Grant to do it by telling him Fibs was Ryan's dealer. What an organizational oddity. Fibs seems to be this gang's only dealer. The pack of junkies finally finds all three guys when their speeches are done. Fight and gunfire break out all over the place, accomplishing nothing. But at least we get more zombie grunting. Cormac barricades himself in the office, finding Lexi and the baby there. She gives him the safe combination, but he's grown wise to her games, telling her she'll open it, and if nothing springs out and maims her, he'll let them go free. It's a miracle. You're finally learning. But then... <sighs> She tells him the safe is empty and motions to a painting on the wall, saying that's where the money is. This, he just walks up to and opens, and there's cash. But tell her to take it down for you and shove it in a sack, just in case. He tells her he still wants the safe, but she refuses. This time with fear in her eyes, he forces her to her knees, gripping her by her neck as she spins the lock. Think with your whole brain, moron. This position forces you into fighting range with a woman who already tricked you, and you're kneeling by a safe you know is booby-trapped. If it contains a nerve gas or explosive, you're dead too. Don't bother. Grab the baby, and she'll do anything you ask. As she enters the last number, she begs for her life. It doesn't work. <laughs> 100% avoidable. Bruh, why didn't you tell him what was inside it? Agree to open it, but say you have to stand off to the side because a bolt's going to fly out. He probably would have believed you. And of course, she was telling the truth. The safe is otherwise empty. So you lost your eye for literally nothing. Well done. Cormac grabs the cash and steps into the hall just in time for a run-in with Grant and Fibs. He offers to split the cash, but Grant would rather fight again for were no reason. Dude, you've already let the cook escape and failed spectacularly at the only thing you came here to do. Cormac is no one and nothing to you. At least leave the building first. The fight's short and convenient. They both land a few solid blows before Cormac gets him on the ground right under a booby trap. Grant sees the dead weight snare overhead and punches Cormac's throat before administering some fatal acupuncture. <laughs> 
Fibs dips out to go grab the baby, as if he knew exactly where to find it, before returning to Grant. And because it can't just be some random baby, Grant realizes it has his brother's unique heterochromatic eyes. Cool. So you're leaving now, right? You've got something more important than revenge to worry about, right? Grant hands the baby back to Fibs and tells him to leave and take the baby somewhere safe. Oh, yeah. He hasn't been able to find a way out before this, and the junky zombies are still wandering aimlessly. But sure, abandon your nephew's fate to a teenage drug dealer. Grant says he can't leave until he kills the cook, but Lithon finds Fibs first, and Grant hears him scream. Grant finds Fibs bound in the lab, and Lithon ready for him. He slices Grant's arm with some sort of tool, and smashes a bottle of chemical across his face. Then, he goes for another snort of nose candy. He reels back, screaming in agony. We cut back to the last time Grant found the lab and learned he crushed a broken glass and laced the cook's lines with it. As this is the first clever thing he's done in his entire life, I'll award him a fraction of a gold star, which I immediately revoke. As he gets to his feet, sends Grant away with the baby again and decides to beat Luthon instead of ending him once and for all. Grab a metal pipe and impale him. Smash the entire lab table on top of him. Do anything except this sh- Grant stops fighting and pulls out his cigarette, joking that with all the candy this guy snorts, he can't smell the gas that has filled the room since Grant opened the canister. He lights the match without knowing if Fibs or the baby have made it out yet, and the entire place blows off screen, because who'd want to see that? Fibs walks away flush with cash and leaves the baby at the hospital. Because someone watched Extraction, a barely incognito Grant reappears inside the police precinct without anyone but the chief noticing. And Lexi reigns supreme as the new queen of her own gang. So, you accomplished nothing, Grant. Way to go. What a happy ending for the world's dumbest heist crew. There's a reason real-world criminals stake out their targets for weeks or months before D-Day. A set of blueprints showing emergency exits, a general schedule for Lexi and Lethon, and a head count of goons would have made this entire thing much easier. There's no point wandering around blindly in a maze full of tweaks out losers who can be botched with a casual promise of drugs. Every hallway is an unknowable death trap, and every room contains a starving tiger until you know otherwise. Grant could have called in police backup at any time using Fibs as an informant, but he wanted revenge for himself, and therefore, everyone else had to die. If he had called the police, a raid would have gotten other cops killed, but with most of the exits booby-trapped, it would have put an end to Lithon and Lexi too. No joke, since he doesn't care about anyone, not even himself, Grant wouldn't need to enter the building at all to kill the cook, if that's what he truly wanted. It'd be as easy as rigging a fire at every exit, save for one, and waiting with a rifle trained on the clear exit for a man in a gas mask to emerge. For those reasons, I think Trap House was beaten. And remember, don't risk your life if you can risk other people's lives.